Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about something that's a little different from my field, but I hope you'll bear with me because you'll see how it ho holds together. Um, but I'll start by talking about the, the question that we focus in in the School of Plant Sciences, which is we're going to expect 10 billion people on this planet by the, uh, the year 2050. And we have about 8 billion at the moment. So the question is, how are we going to feed all of these people? What are we going to do to produce enough food? And how are we going to make this sustainable? And the sustainability question is, is quite critical because we, we, we can't anticipate that things will get better in the future. Um, and so we have to think about this. You know, one of the most important things is that we reduce population growth, that we reduce resource consumption, and that we reduce waste accumulation. Um, but in, in the, uh, the idea of aberration here is, comes from the, the concept now that maybe we can just escape the Earth and go throughout the solar system and leave behind this planet. And this has become very popular, the idea of colonizing the, the cosmos. And the NASA, of course, and the titans of industry, and there are three of the titans, um, all say, let's escape. And I like, would like to say to you, what if they are all wrong? So my story starts in England. My students like to say to me, you've got a wonderful accent. I say, it's a language. It's called English. <laughs> you have the accent. I was born in Wantage, which is just south of Oxford, and has a population of 5,000. There's nothing much special about Wantage, except it's five miles away from a place called AERE Harwell. This was an airfield which was used during the Second World War, and it was converted into becoming an atomic research institute. And my father was a PhD physicist working on cosmic rays at this institute. Uh, now, cosmic rays are interesting things. Um, people had found earlier in the century that as you go higher in the atmosphere and you measure radiation, you find that the radiation levels go up. And this is most perplexing to scientists because we all know about radioactive elements that are in the ground, things like uranium. And so the thought would be, as you go up in the atmosphere, you should be getting further away from these sources of radiation. Radon's another example. You all know about radon um, in the basements that we don't have in Tucson. But if we did, you'd be accumulating radon there. It would be a bad thing. Radioactive. But instead, when they went up high, they found radiation levels were going up. And this was most perplexing. And they also did measurements um, during solar eclipses because they thought, well, maybe the sun is one of the issues and it's producing radiation and maybe it comes from that. They expected radiation to originate from the, the Earth, but um, even during eclipses, you find radiation levels are higher upper in the upper atmosphere. And this was found to be due to cosmic rays. And these are particles which enter the atmosphere from outer space. And as soon as cosmic rays were detected, the question was, where do they come from? What are they? And can you detect them cheaply? And can you point detectors at wherever they're coming from and identify those sources? So my father was charged with doing that kind of work. He did the, what I would call the original garbage science. And let me explain. He got a garbage can, and he sprayed the inside of it with black paint. He took a World War II surplus searchlight mirror which was convenient, since it was just after the, the Second World War. Um, and he triggered it to make measurements of the lights in the sky when a cosmic ray hits a radiation detector nearby. And the prediction was that you would be able to measure the cosmic ray coming into the atmosphere by the light that it produced by interacting with the atmosphere. And so this is literally garbage science. Um, the, the cost of the experiment was, the, was very little. Now, look at Mount Hopkins. These are all the same things. These are all detectors which are detecting light, which is being focused onto a light detector. This is called gamma ray astronomy. It's a billion dollar business now. And there are rays all over the world looking for cosmic rays and looking for the sources of these cosmic rays. So from garbage science to multi-billion dollar science. Amazing, really. Why am I telling you all of this? What are cosmic rays? Why should we fear them? And why are we protected? These are immensely high energy atomic nuclei. These are the things that are in the center of atoms. And they're originating from outside the solar system and they're moving nearly the speed of light. And they're coming in all directions at us on the Earth. 
And they have about 40 million times the energy of particles that we can produce on the Earth in our big uh, collider machines. Uh, each, each ray, each of these rays has the kinetic energy of a 56 mile per hour fastball. Um, well, it's not really a fastball because Mother Nature is actually throwing us a curveball or two, as you'll see in a minute. So this is what happens. You have the cosmic rays coming in at the speed of light. It hits the top of the atmosphere and it interacts. It smashes into the molecules that it finds there. And this produces a cascade of particles and light. And the light is called Cherenkov radiation because a Russian, Cherenkov, was the first person to detect this. And this light is also seen in all those movies that you see, like the China Syndrome, where you see a reactor and it's in the bottom of a swimming pool, you see this sort of blue glow coming out. Well, that's Cherenkov radiation coming from the energetic particles that are coming out of the reactor and then producing light. The, the two things that are really critical for life on Earth are the atmosphere, which, of course, we breathe, but it also protects us from those cosmic rays. It, it, the, the cosmic rays are dissipated as they come through the atmosphere and they produce light, the light comes down to the ground. My father detected it. We detect it on Mount Hopkins, but it doesn't hurt us. Um, and the other thing is the Earth's magnetic field. We have an iron core in our planet, and this causes a magnetic field, which also protects us from radiation coming from various sources, including cosmic rays. So a major source of energy and radiation, of course, is the sun. And so 93 million miles between the sun and Earth, the magnetic field of the Earth is responsible for deflecting away many of the radiating particles coming from the sun and also from uh, other parts of the galaxy. Um, the problem about all this, of course, is if you go to the moon, if you go to Mars, there are no magnetic fields and there's very little atmosphere. There's no, no atmosphere on the moon. There's very little atmosphere on Mars. So that means all the habitats that we build there have to be underground to be suitably screened. Um, the problem also is getting there. So it's going to take you at least three years to get to Mars. And if you calculate, between one-sixth and one-half of brain cells will be directly hit by one or more cosmic rays. In fact, uh, our astronauts have already detected cosmic rays themselves as little flashes of light that they see. The cosmic ray goes into their eye, interacts with the vitreous humor in there, produces the photons, Cherenkov radiation, within the astronaut's eyes, which they then see. So that has been reported. The problem with this is, if you're hitting brain cells with all of these, these cosmic rays, what's going to happen to those brain cells? It's not good, OK? <laughs> so we can do tests with smaller, uh, less energetic cosmic rays. We can make oxygen and titanium nuclei, and we can accelerate them at Brookhaven National Lab and shoot them into mice, which sounds rather unpleasant, but um, we have to do these things. And you do cognitive tests on the mice. That is, they know how to get out of a maze. You irradiate them, and then they forget how to get out of the maze, that sort of thing. And then you can also slice up their brains. This is very cruel and unusual. <laughs> but it's cruel and unusual for these kinds of experiments. Um, and you count the number of dendrites, and they're, they're fewer and shorter. So radiation is bad for the brain. And it would be bad for astronauts' brains as well. They would become more stupid, and eventually they would die. So what about screening? Let's, you know, you, you've seen the movie uh, The Martian. They have a nice little plastic screen, a little, uh, you know, a plastic greenhouse, and he engineers like crazy. Um, no, that's not going to work. The cosmic rays are so energetic, you need 500 tons of screening uh, to protect an astronaut from all the cosmic rays. And that's much too large to get into uh, space and to accelerate it out of Earth orbit and into Mars orbit and then get down onto Mars. Now, so I calculated a few things. 500 tons, that's 120,000 gallons of water. And since this is Arizona, we have to think in terms of average backyard pool sizes. So it's a 25 by 25 by 25 foot cube of water. It's about three to four times the size of pools. So, Every astronaut is going to be surrounded by three to four pool equivalents of water going to Mars. So if you ask the astronaut how it's going, he would say, well, it's going swimmingly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you're in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you might ask the question, what about iron, man? <laughs> I, I, I said I'd... <laughs> 
so everybody thinks about this. We can have a better screen. Let's, let's have a better screen. But iron has a density about eight times that of water. You don't actually gain very much. You end up with a cube of iron, which is 13 feet cube on a, on a, a, a dimension. So it's the same weight, but it's just a little bit smaller. So you'd be inside a cube of iron. Um, or you could screen the entire surface of a spaceship with 13-inch thick iron plates. Now, this is <laughs> Titanic-style constru construction. And I think you could imagine if you have a, a reasonably sized spaceship, this would weigh an enormous amount. What I would propose is we're stuck here on Earth with no chance of ever, ever colonizing other planets or other solar systems because, you know, the next star is many light years away, and um, that's going to take much longer to get there. This brings up Fermi, Enrico Fermi, Italian scientist, Nobel laureate. He was the first person to build an atomic pile that had a sustainable nuclear reaction. And he built it at the University of Chicago. And he went to the president of the University of Chicago and said, I, I want to build a, a, a nuclear reactor. And the president said, that's fine. You can put it under the football stadium bleachers. <laughs> now, the president <laughs> didn't like football very much. And I think he canceled the football program the following year. But can you imagine us tr proposing to build a nuclear reactor underneath the football stadium here, or even the basketball arena, or whatever, um, without any controls at all? But Fermi built his reactor, and he had his graduate students, they very carefully added uranium to it and discovered that they could get a sustainable nuclear reactor. And this then translated to the Manhattan Project, because it happened in 1942. And then that led to the end of the Second World War, as we all know. Um, but Fermi also came up with the paradox. After the, the Second World War, he was at a conference, and he was having lunch, and he suddenly said, where is everybody? And they all looked at him, well, what are you talking about? This is the contradiction between the high estimates of the probability of alien existence and no evidence for them at all. And so this is what's the famous Fermi paradox. It goes like this. There are billions of stars in the galaxy and billions of planets. We know this. A lot of these stars are much older than our sun. We've evolved space travel, so it's, it's reasonable that there must be billions of examples of other civilizations that have evolved space travel. And it's pretty easy to cross the Milky Way, although that's a big galaxy. They estimate it would take about a million years to cross it. Um, but there's no sign of aliens. There's no sign of aliens here or anywhere else. Oh, I used to be a resident alien before I became a US citizen, <laughs> but that's not quite the same thing. Where is everybody, said Fermi. And so people have been trying to resolve Fermi's paradox, and uh, I would propose that cosmic rays are continuously sterilizing the universe and eliminating the possibility that different biological life forms will ever be able to meet. So that's a problem. Um, now, the only thing I can't quite get my head around is that we ought to be able to encounter silicon life forms, like the Borg, for example, because we can already make computers that can detect when they have cosmic rays hitting them. And they can self, research like this is going on at the University of Arizona. They can detect when their circuits, microcircuits, have been hit by cosmic rays, and then they can program around the damaged part. And so the only other step you need is you need to have a large enough and complicated enough computer which has self-awareness, and then you might be able to be traveling through the, the universe in that fashion. But we don't see the Borg either, so it's, it's a, little, a little puzzling. That, that I, I can't resolve yet. There is no planet B, is the conclusion. The problem is we have this planet, we have to solve the problems that we have on our planet, and we have to deal with them in an efficient and humane fashion for us to survive sustainably into the future. Here are some uh, uh, acknowledgments. That's my father on the, on the left side and his co-worker, John Jelly. And this is the paper that came out in Nature on February 21st, 1953. Now, I, OK, I'll tell you. I was born in 1952 in May. And I think I was responsible for all of this. <laughs> uh, I'll just explain. So I was born in May, and I apparently was quite a noisy child at night. And so immediately after I was born, apparently, my father went off with John, and they started doing detection of cosmic rays in the middle of the night, <laughs> far away from my house. <laughs> 
the next year, they, they decided they had to go to the south of France, uh, the france Spain border, to do these measurements. Now, there's a good reason for doing that. In England, even though we have an astronomer royal, it's always cloudy, it's always raining, so it's very difficult to see stars, and it's very difficult to detect cosmic rays coming from above. So the best thing to do is to go up on top of the, uh, the peak Eumedi, which is in the Pyrenees, go up to 10,000 feet and measure them there. So I'm, less, I'm just well, about a year old, and my father's deserted me and my mother and gone to the south of France, where I'm sure they had a lot of a good time, good food, good <laughs> wine. And they were successful in detecting cosmic rays and importantly, showing that the, what they were detecting what had a, an energy spectrum which was consistent with what they uh, eventually found cosmic rays to, to be. So um, that's the story behind my family and also the fact that, you know, in a sense, I was brought into the world and by the time I was one, my father had discovered that it would be impossible for me ever to get off this planet, which I feel is a little, a little ironic or something. And that's all, folks. There's no planet B. Thank you. Thank you.